All right, so let's continue on with number 32. Now this is the part of the test where that repeats itself now. We did one through, in this case, uh, 31, so time is one through 30. And um, that goes from atomic structure to nuclear. This kind of resets itself now. When you go to the second part, those that just walked in, okay, I am doing these, this test. Anybody else needs a test that walked in? That's it. Right. So here. <laughs> Okay, so, 32. So, yeah, now 32 through 50 now, this part B1, B2, part B1 in this case, these two right here, guys. This right here? Free money right here? What? <laughs> okay, let's start over again. So here we go, 32. All right, we guys make it smaller so we can see what's going on here. Uh, yeah, smaller, I think I said. The data table below represents properties determined by the analysis of substances A, B, C, and D. Which substance is an ionic compound? An ionic compound, okay, does not make molecules, it makes crystals. It's a repeating arrangement of ions, metal, non-metal, or anything that's positive and negative. Now, what do we know about these things? We know that when they're a solid, they're terrible conductors because their ions are not free. Only when they're liquefied, or aqueous, do you make free ions? So I'm looking for an ionic compound. The conductivity I'm going to look first to, none and none, that would be molecular. Things that make molecules, things that have covalent bonds, don't break apart into ions except for the acids. So I'm looking for conductivity as a solid. Mm, ionic compounds, their ions are fixed in these three-dimensional ranges. Their ions are not free. You should know, and I love to ask you about this. This is a core concept, ionic compounds. And the electricity only in the liquid or aqueous phases, sometimes called molten liquid, because their ions are free. So their conductivity is never going to be in a solid. If they conduct in a solid, we're talking about a metal, bonding to a metal like copper. Okay? But here is in solution. In solution, if they dissolve, look at the melting points. Why are they going to be hot? You should know that things that are ionic have high melting points because a positive and negative is one of the strongest attractions in nature. So it takes a lot of energy to melt ionic compounds. Ionic is metal and non-metal? Yes. So you said non-metal and non-metal is like stronger. I'm sorry, I meant to say that a, anything positive and negative. Okay, now, things that are molecular, things that are non-metals and non-metals, yeah. even if they're polar because of their polar bonds, they're not completely <laughs> plus one and negative one. They're partial negatives. Things that are ionic, it was a clear transfer of electrons. Remember the story I told? Me and my three-year-old son? Okay, I pulled a rope from him, okay, after he's done crying. I don't play the rope again, but I pulled a rope from him because I'm so much stronger. There's a complete transfer. So this is a completely, at least, a positive one or a negative one. And that's why the attractive forces are stronger, and that's why they exist always as solids. Things that are covalently bonded are molecular compounds. They make molecules. They don't stick together nearly as strong. Think of things that are covalently bonded as butter, plastics, leather, okay? That gives you a good understanding of what kind of energy it takes to, to heat them, to, to, to melt them. But these things are like rocks, okay? A lot more energy because these are positive, at least positive one, negative one. Or in any case, high melting point and conducting in solution is clearly going to be your ionic compound. So they're both, they both have like strong. Yeah, ionic compounds are considered to be bonds in this course, okay. but they're the, one of the strongest types of bonds because a positive one and a negative one is completely positive one will stick together electrostatically very strong. And because of that, all ionic, all ionic compounds are solids, which means they never conduct because these ions aren't free until they dissolve or you heat them as liquids. Then you'll have free ions. So the key there was in solution and high melting point, screaming ionic. So choice D, choice four. <coughs> Bless you. Number 33. I think coughing's more dangerous than sneezing. So. 33 was the total number of electrons in chromium plus three ion. Okay, I'm gonna start with the atom, chromium. What do I know about an atom? It's, I say atom, you say? Neutral. neutral. Protons equal electrons, so my starting point 
is the atom of chromium. So go to your reference table or your periodic table. Okay, get a little smaller. Let's go to chromium. And we find that chromium, when it's an atom, they're all written as atoms, has 24 protons and 24 electrons. That's my starting point. Okay, it's a part two question that could be. Now, I'm starting with 24 electrons equaling 24 protons. When it becomes plus three, it does not gain protons. It's still chromium. So that number of 24 protons stays the same. For it to become plus three, like all metals who are big, who hold on to electrons loosely, they lose them. How many do they lose? Three. So they start out with 24 when they're an atom, and they lose three. So how many electrons do I have? 21. If you do the math, 21 electrons is negative 21. 24 protons, positive 24. That gives you a negative three overall. By the way, did it get bigger or smaller when it became plus three? Lost weight, lost electrons, got smaller. So 21's the answer. That could be a part two question, party people. That would pop up. You see, Mr. Krause, I've never seen a part two question that simple. They're all that simple. They just hide them with stuff. We're going to see that today. So chromium, 21, choice two. 34 has the atoms in group 17. Here we go. It's my halogens in the ground state are considered from top to bottom, from smaller to big. Each successive element has the same number of valence electrons. Yes. The reason why Dimitri Mendel put them in a certain order. He noticed as I put atoms that got heavier, he noticed the properties were repeating over and over again. Why do they have the same properties? Because they have the same valence electrons. Now, he didn't know about valence electrons. He just knew the properties were similar. So same number of valence electrons and similar chemical properties. Identical, nothing is identical because it would be the same atom. Increasing number of valence, increase, no, same valence number of electrons and similar chemical properties. That's why they were put over each other. So cho 34 mm -hmm. is choice one. 35. Okay, which solution when mixed with a drop of bromo thymol blue will cause the indicator to change from blue to yellow? Okay, well, we're going to need table MM or table N -N good to see what color change when bromo thymol gets yellow. So we go to table M. Okay, and by the way, I have a crash course on the review of every reference table. That might be helpful if I just knew my um, alphabet here. Okay, so I think I'm below. So table, mm, mm good, and we want bromel thymol blue getting yellow. There it is. Oh, getting yellow would mean, right, I'm 6.0 or lower, so I'm looking for an acid. That's how you read table um, M. So I'm looking for an acid, and acids donate H pluses, choice one. Now, if you didn't know this party, people, they give you a table of acids. Okay, and by the way, HCl is given there for the acid. All right, so that, that's it. Easy as pie on a Sunday afternoon, unless you don't have pie. That's it, that's a base. This is an alcohol, not a, not a base, and that's a base. Okay, this is listed in table, the next table below. Moving forward, 36. Empirical means what? Lowest ratio. So they want the lowest ratio of N2O4. They want you to reduce 2 and 4. I think it might be NO2. Okay? And if you, now, the math is easy. You had no empirical is the lowest ratio. So 2 to 4 becomes 1 to 2. Choice 2. There's nothing more to cover. 30, questions, on, questions like that, I go, really? Really? 37. Don't overthink these. I like this question. I've had yet to see in a long time a Lewis dot diagram for ionic compounds. How do I know it's ionic? Metal, non-metal. Good at losing electrons, good at gaining. It's me and my three-year-old. There's a transfer of the rope. He's going to get negative. He's going to get positive. So he's going to lose all his valence, okay? And he's going to, with, with Seven valence electrons, group 17, gain one more. So you should show fluorine with eight and negative one. You should show magnesium plus two. Now, of course, the answer here is choice three. What is wrong if you do this? 
This is implying sharing. Metal and non-metal won't share. The, the difference in strength is so great there's going to be a transfer. This is better, but magnesium doesn't become plus one. Magnesium loses two. If you look at magnesium in the reference table, upper right hand corner tells you it loves to become plus two only. So that won't be it. This is showing sharing. So although the best choice is three, I like this question because this could be a part two question. They can give you some kind of blur with magnesium fluorine and say, hey, draw me the Lewis dot diagram between the bonding of the product of something. And the product could be magnesium fluoride. And I bet 50% of the students will draw something like this. Oh, Lewis dot diagram shows sharing. Uh-uh. If it's ionic, we show usually brackets. Now, you don't have to have the brackets. Brackets are being polite, OK? Because brackets help me realize that these, uh, these electrons belong to the fluorine. These electrons belong to the fluorine. And this doesn't have any electrons because it lost them. And why is there two? Fluorine has seven. It needed one of the electrons that magnesium had. And this one had seven, so you need another one. Are we good with that? It's important that you understand the difference. This is an ionic compound. You need to show sh uh, transferring to draw that. And for those that are saying, I'm not sure quite how you got to that point, Mr. Grodsky. Well, magnesium has two valence electrons. How do I know? I go to my periodic table. And I look for my magnesium, and there it is in all its glory. And it has 2 8 2, two valence electrons, two, two dots. Fluorine, as I think my tour across the periodic table, has seven valence electrons. So back to my question, and again, this would be as if it was a part two. Fluorine has seven dots. So this would take one, and it would make this. And then you need another fluorine to come by who has seven to grab the other one to make this. That's how that works. 37 is three. But this could be a part two where they ask you to draw it themselves. 38. Mm -hmm. Given this type of reaction, first of all, I see a standalone atom. What kind of reaction is this automatically? Redox, right. And one of the major types of redox reactions are single replacement. All right? Nothing more. One thing is replacing the system. Now, this they could say in part two, what kind of reaction is this? And you could say single replacement, you could say redox. Okay, so this is again a multiple choice question, but certainly has its implications in part two. So single replacement. There's nothing more to that. Magnesium single replaces the aluminum to make magnesium in the free. Silver, 39. Which equation shows conservation of both mass and charge? All reactions should show conservation of mass and charge, especially redox reactions. So clearly here, I have chlorine and negative. So a zero plus a negative one is negative one. This side is negative one. So the charge is balanced. But if you look carefully, there's two bromides, one bromide. I cross that one out. Here, 2 times plus 1 is plus 2, plus a 0, right? So that gives me a plus 2 on this side. This side is plus 2. If you notice something, there's what? Two silvers and one silver. So I cross out 2, I cross out 1. Choice 3, plus 3 on this side, plus 2 on this side. Last one, plus two on this side, plus two overall on this side. Remember, the standalone elements, protons equal electrons, are zero. And notice there's one nickel, one nickel, one lead, one lead. Our mass, conservation of mass means same number of elements and same type on both sides. One nickel, one nickel, one lead, one lead. And charge means, of course, same charge on both sides. And both sides are plus two. Okay. Choice four. What was wrong with that? Uh, first, one. first one, the charge was conserved, but not the mass. You have what? Two bromides here and one bromide here. Okay? Good question. 40. The volume of a gas is 4 liters at a certain temperature. Hey, this is our first math problem. 
Simply say, I hate the math. I can't do chemistry. I don't like the math. There's so little math on this test. Okay? So how do I do this? You have one gas, you have one mass, uh, you have one um, gas law equation. Okay, and it's given to you in uh, table T. Let's go there. All right, if you forget, here it is. Is there like a rehearsal going on today? All right, so table T is your friend. Let's go there and let's look at the combined gas law. This is all you're going to need. By the way, they call it the ideal sometimes, but um, any case, there it is. So pressure, volume, and temperature. The only catch here is that temperature must be in what unit? Kelvin, right. It must be that proportional value. So any case, my friends in chemistry, let's get started with the problem. And it was number 30 what? 40. 40, yeah. So let's make it small. Let's make some space for myself. They just want the setup here. I'll make it even smaller. Um, let's put it on this thing. Thank you. Okay, so let's make some room for ourselves here. Because I can do that. All right, so PV equals P, uh, PV over T equals PV over T. Now, that's what they say. The volume of a gas is 4 liters at a certain temperature at constant pressure. So if I'm using this formula, PV over T, I call this the current scenario. PV over T, this is the future. What's constant? Pressure, so just X it out. So it's volume over temperature of a current scenario is volume over temperature in the future. So what do they have? A volume of a gas at 4 liters at 293 Kelvin. They're nice. They're giving us a Kelvin already. That goes together. Is that constant pressure for the volume of gas to become 3 liters? Okay. The Kelvin temperature, and there's your X, is that. Solve for X. So which um, choice shows that? Now, many people come, come to the right answers um, differently. Okay. I like to use algebra. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for X. And X is going to equal to be uh, 4 liters. I'm going to bring the 3 liters below, 293 Kelvin, all right, and 3 liters. I just, I just did algebra. And what I solve for is 1 over X. I know in algebra, I just bring that down. Now, I want to solve for X over 1. So what I would do is do the reciprocal of both sides. Now, some people can cross multiply. I don't know, dynamite method, I'm not sure. But I solve for X, I bring this down to the bottom algebraically then I want to solve for x over 1, so I flip it. So x over 1 is the same thing as what? 293 Kelvin times 3 liters over 4 liters. And by the way, okay, there it is. Uh, where's my 4 liters? There it is. Choice uh, 1 is the same thing. Now, if some of you guys don't like that, find the answer. You don't like that the way that I did it? Find the answer and see which one is the answer. Don't, don't you know, spend time. I got plenty of time. So 40 is choice one. 41. What is the molarity? What the heck is a molarity? Well, if you go to table T, molarity, my friends, is, molarity is equal to moles of solute over a liter of solution. So if you didn't know what that was, table T is your friend also. It gives you the same formula. So what are they giving me? 20 grams of NaOH and 50 milliliters of water, so they want the molarity. Uh, they're giving me 500 milliliters of, of solution. How many liters is that? Well, if you don't know, take 500 milliliters. I want to get rid of milliliters. Where do milliliters, where do milliliters go? If I'm trying to cancel them all. Right. And I want liters. I know for one liter, there's 1,000 milliliters. So I'm dividing by 1,000, and I get point five liters. That's how you convert party people. I write 500 milliliters. I want to get rid of milliliters, so I put it on the bottom. And now the ratio is 1,000 milliliters to liter. Now people say, how do you know which number goes where? You measure the length of Brodsky into the science wing. And then we pick, and then we kind of pick uh, I don't know, Noah. You measure the, the science wing of Noah's length of his body. I'm a bigger unit, so there's less numbers for my unit or more numbers? Because I'm a bigger unit, 
measure the same thing, it takes less Skrotskys. So who's got a bigger unit? A liter or a milliliter? A liter is a bigger unit, lower number. Smaller unit, no, or bigger number. Okay? No offense, man. I'm just, I'm just, you know, a genetic nightmare. Okay, so, uh, moving forward. So it's 5 lead point 0.5. Now, grams. Whoa, NaOH. Well, I know NaOH is 40 grams per mole, but we have to do some work here. NaOH. Whoa, I like that. Okay, anyway, I need the grams to go to the moles, right? Why? Because it's moles over liters. So I got to convert this to moles. So when I do that, party people, I take my 20 grams and I want to get rid of grams. So where do grams go? Bottom. Bottom. I want a mole. One mole is how many grams? I need a formula mass. So I'm going to take a formula mass of this. A lot of steps here. Okay, there's one Na. One times the mass of sodium is 23. Now I got the 23 party people. Okay, I'm sorry people getting this right away and I'm going through every, every step, but there's people who don't. So I go to sodium and I look up at atomic mass and it's 23. I know that because I'm a loser. And then I have oxygen. When I've used that, oxygen has an atomic mass of, I round off to 16. And then of course H has an atomic mass of 1. Those, that's where I'm getting the numbers from. Okay, so I go back to this. So I got one sodium, one times 23. Last time I checked is 23. Then we have one oxygen, one times 16. Last time I checked is 16. And I have one H, one times one. Put that in your calculator, I'll wait. One, add them together, you get 40 grams per mole. That 40 goes right there. It's a lot of steps here. 20 divided by 40 is 0.5 moles. And because it's moles over liters, lo and behold, 0.5 goes over 0.5, and it's a chorus of 1. 41 is 1. That is the hardest molarity problem I've ever seen on a test. But it's not that hard. You either realize that you needed moles, so you had to convert your grams to moles, so you needed a formula mass. Sometimes they give you the formula mass, as you recognize. And you had to take this milliliters and convert to liters. So a lot going on there. And I feel sad for you, but I'm over. Okay, so moving forward. Number 42. Okay, which relationship best represents pressure volume relationship? Okay, I love this question. Okay, I love it. And I use Captain Gas Law to do this. Okay, so they got this, which is showing the correct relationship. Okay, so if you find yourself in a scenario where you forget your volume, temperature, and pressure, write your gas law, VP over T or PV over T. I do vice presidents over teachers. Take your test, okay, rip a corner of it off, put your volume stuff here, and here's how I use it. If you forget, if temperature is constant, volume goes up, pressure does what? If volume goes down, pressure goes right. I can do the other ones. Volume stays constant, temperature goes up, pressure goes up. That's directly proportionate. Temperature drops, what happens to pressure? Right. Don't keep going. It kind of messes things up. See? Pressure stays constant. This is, just, this is Charles' law. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. Temperature goes down, volume goes. You guys saw that, Mr. Deal or Ms. Fafalo or me. We put liquid nitrogen in a balloon, into the volume of the balloon decreased. So th these right here are directly proportionate. Directly proportionate or straight lines. So temperature goes up the same much as volume goes up if um, pressure is constant. If volume is constant, temperature goes up the same amount of pressure. Or like, so P, T and P or B and T are directly proportionate, but temperature constant, okay, if I make a space small, uh, big, uh, I'm sorry, bigger, okay, like in a syringe, I pull back on a syringe, the pressure drops. This is inverse. An inverse relationship is this line right here. Okay, so this might help you in a pinch. Now why? Now, they could ask you to draw these. In, the, in a part two. They could say, hey, draw me the relationship between pressure and volume. What you don't want to do is draw a straight line. If you draw a straight line, you're implying that there's going to be a point where the volume goes to zero. Can the volume ever go to zero if my pressure drops? If I think about it, I got a container and I, and I drop the pressure. Can the volume go to zero? Don't gas molecules themselves have zero? So think with me. This line can't go to zero. Just like this line can't hit zero here. They have to be asymptotic. Okay? So that's the line. This 
Okay, that one right there, I think is, if you choose this one, I can't help you today. So you really just fill it in, make it a happy ghost. Okay? This one is the pulse. If, this is the pulse that you have if you choose this one, okay? So you should choose between these two. These are the only relationships between gas laws. This is a direct proportion. This is the inverse relationship called Boyle's law. So it's this, it's choice four. Four is the answer. Okay, moving forward. You tell my students sometimes in the region because they have their ripped off corner. Okay? All right, given the reaction or the equation, this reaction is best described as, well now, if this was a part two question, if they asked for the name of it, what could you say? Say it again. Yeah, I guess you could. Better one be what? <coughs> say zero? You can say redox. Okay, but this is the reaction they pick apart a lot. This is called the reaction. By the way, is this saturated or unsaturated? Is this holding on to the max amount of H as possible or not? I don't, it's saturated. And if you don't know, you could draw it. Two carbons, hey, if they're single bonded, the max amount of H's it can hold is six. Or, in table Q, they give you this general form is CN, H, 2, N, plus 2. So if I've got two carbons, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2, that gives me six H's. So if I'm saturated or an alkane, okay, if I have two carbons, I have to have six H's. Now, my friends in chemistry, because this thing is saturated, there is no room to add to this. So this would not be addition. In order for this to work, you have to substitute one Cl for an H. So this has to come off. And if you're substituting one Cl for an H, you're going to have two products. The H came off, the Cl went on. So this is substitution involving always, always a saturated hydrocarbon. The reason why you have to substitute is there's no room. Addition reactions look like this. Addition is when you have an unsaturated hydrocarbon. Watch party people. So if I had this, if I had ethene, this holds less H's because carbon makes four bonds. And if Cl2 was to come by, what would happen? It would attack this double bond, open it, and what you would make, you'd make this saturated hydrocarbon, and you would see that the two chlorines, everything would add to the hydrocarbon chain. And notice there was what? Two products. So in order to have addition, you have to have a double or a triple bond for everything to add. If they're single bonds and saturated, there's only room for one to come on, and one has to come off for one to come on. So it's substitution involving a saturated always. It's choice three. It's a great question. And they love to pick apart that. Okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the famous ones I see a lot. 44, love it. Electrolytic cells, love the question. Okay, now is this a voltaic cell, electrolytic? Is this one needs a battery or this one is a battery? It needs a battery. So what we're trying to do, it looks like we're trying to plate something onto the, uh, onto the key. Okay? Given the reduction for this cell. Okay. Red cat anox always, always works for a battery or electrolytic cell like this. Red cat anox always. So what does that mean? Anox means the anode is always oxidation. In the KISS case, red cat means the cathode is the place of reduction. So given the reduction for this cell, I guess it's a question, see? Okay, they're telling you the reduction. Where does this occur? That's so simple, guys. I don't need that drawing. If it's reduction, it's the cathode. So I know it's this one or this one. The question is, okay, what are we doing? You're making from an aqueous ion a solid metal. Where is that occurring? I want a solid metal up here. Is the solid metal going to appear on the object to be plated? Right? The whole purpose of this cell. Now, if you don't understand what's going on here, okay, the anode of the battery is negative. 
Let's go over the problem, this part, this part here. You have to know this. So this is the anode of the battery. How do I know it? It's negative. They make the anode of the voltage cell negative because that's the place where electrons come out of. Electrons flow from what to what? Always. Always. Anode to cathode. Why? At the anode, there's oxidation. What is oxidation? Leo, losing electrons. So the anode is the place of oxidation. It loses electrons. How do electrons get passed around? They have to get passed around from one who's losing to the one who's what? Accepting. It can't be the other way around. So electrons always flow. Always anox, always red cat, always electrons flow from anode to the cathode. So here's my anode. It's negative. Electrons flow from the anode to the what? Oh, is there cathode? By the way, what charge is it? I know it's not part of the problem, what charge is it? It's negative. Why is it negative? The battery is making it negative. Okay? This is positive, so what's this? Positive. The battery is making it positive. By the way, if this is the cathode, what's this? The anode. And electrons flow from what? Anode back to the cathode of the battery. And my friends, if you don't follow this, if you have electroplating, the object to, that's going to be plated is always the cathode. Why? When you plate something, it's reduction. When you make a solid, anytime you make a metal that's zero, you're making a solid. And when you reduce an ion and make it a solid, it has to occur at the cathode, no matter what cell I give you. You're lost completely on this. If you go to uh, my um, crash course in redox, or you go to um, yeah, go to crash course in redox. Underneath it, if you don't look at it, I have individual lectures on these that go into more detail. But reduction is always the cathode. Red cat reduction always the cathode. Okay, so I knew it had to be the cathode. I knew the object to be plated is always reduction. So that's that was important. Those are the important keys in this question. Key to the question. Okay. The key to the is the key in the question? No. It's what the answer. Oh, sorry. Didn't get the answer. So uh, uh, A, which is the cathode? Yes. Choice two. And that was the key to the question. <laughs> you laughed five minutes ago. I wanted to keep saying it. Okay. Forty-five. I know, I'm corny and tall. More tall than corny, hopefully. All right. Where did the word corny come from? Did the person have corn come out of his ears or something? All right, so here we go. Another classic Regent's question. I've got a student. Why not? He neutralized this amount of acid, H in front, by adding this amount of base, metal, what is the molarity of the acid? This is a titration problem. If you've done any review, you've done 20,000s of these. Now, here's how I teach it. Now, if you don't know what formula to use for a titration problem, guess what? Table T is your friend. And we, let's go find some friends for you. And there it is. Now, MV of the acid equals MV of the base. I'm not a big fan of MA and VA. I think there's too many A's. I get crazy with that. But this is our titration problem. See, here's what I do. Okay, and you can do this any which way you like, but it's pretty straightforward. Okay, I take M V of the acid equal M V of the base. Okay, I've got what volume of acid? 16.4 milliliters. Make sure you pair it up properly by adding, a student neutralize this much, and by adding what? 12.7 milliliters of a base, its concentration is 0 0.620. They want to find the molarity, Boom. okay? So there's my molarity. So I solve for x. This goes in the bottom, 16.4 milliliters. Notice the milliliters cancel and leave you with molarity, what you're looking for. So our x or our molarity is equal to 0.6 2 times 12.7, 6 times 4, who's got a number? I can estimate it. 0.48, yeah, choice But you can probably estimate. All right, now, here's what I will say. 
Very, be very careful with these questions. Notice this acid was HCl. Okay, HCl. Notice the H in front is 1H. This is 1 hydroxyl. This is a 1 to 1. There are questions that pop up where the acid is diprotic. This could be H2SO4. So if you had an acid, 99% of the time you get these straightforward ones. But if this is H2SO4 and this is KOH, this acid has twice the amount of H's. What you do in this case is, if this acid was not one to one, okay, if it was H2SO4, okay, I put the two right in the equation right here. Just if, just if, if um, I was dealing with a, a, di, um, a dibasic compound. But what, what if my acid was this? Uh, oops, 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 oops. Christmas in July. What if my acid was a calcium hydroxide? I have twice the number, and I have HCl. Well, I put the two on the base side, and you solve it. Okay, so I'm sure your teacher made you aware of that. Okay, in any case. Okay, so in any case, if it was a, if it was a dye basic, you put the two on the side that had the two. All right, moving forward. So that would be choice two. And uh, did I erase something down here? Okay, 46, nuclear fusion. Now, you have to know the difference between fission and fusion. Okay, if you don't, crash course in nuclear chem is probably what you want to do, but I'll help you out a little quicker today. Fusion means light and nuclei are coming together. Classic case of nuclear fusion, which is what the star our sun uses. It's what we're trying to build because there are uh, no real waste products there. It's an un un you know, unlimited supply of energy. Nuclear fusion is like, Hydrogen 3 plus another hydrogen coming together to make helium. That's fusing together. Okay? Fission is like uranium 92, 235, plus a neutron splits into, let's say, krypton and barium, I don't know specifics, and then three more neutrons. This is splitting the atom. Okay, but you're doing so with a very large nuclei. Okay, so nuclear fusion, not fission, fusing together um, differs from fission because fusions form um, heavier isotopes from lighter ones. So they're getting a little bit heavier from lighter ones. Now this idea of converting mass to energy and energy to mass, be careful with this. Every single nuclear equation there's something called, there's something called mass defect. Anytime, whether it's fission or fusion, we mass up the reactants, we mass up the products, we're missing some mass in nuclear reactions, not chemical reactions. That missing mass has been converted to energy. This one produces about a thousand times more energy, so it's missing a little more mass that comes up. So we convert mass to energy in both of these. Yes? What's the difference between fission and fusion? Well, fission is splitting the atom, the slow-moving neutron, and you make smaller fragments, so smaller atoms, and you make three more neutrons. So what we're doing is taking an unstable nucleus, and we're basically breaking it apart into fragments, okay? And energy is given off because some of the mass on this side is now missing on this side, and it's converted to energy, like Einstein's famous equation equals mc squared. Fusion is taking lighter nuclei and pushing them together to make a bigger nucleus. And if you think about fusion, it means fusing together, sticking together. It's lighter nuclei. Our sun does this. We were able to discover helium from the sun first because of this reaction that occurs in our stars or in our suns. So the hydrogen bomb, our current nuclear warhead, uses H-bombs, uses nuclear fusion. We call it an H-bomb because they use hydrogen as the fuel. The bombs dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima were fission bombs, okay? And we used uranium and plutonium to fission them. Our current bombs are about 700 to 1,000 times more powerful than the bombs dropped in the 40s there, okay? We're trying to come up with this um, formula or this reactor. Supposedly Lockheed Martin is building a fusion reactor, and supposedly the size of your desk you're standing at will be able to provide energy for 400,000 homes. 
from it, from just using basically water. Pretty amazing stuff if they can ever figure that out. The problem with this that you should know for the test though is we haven't figured it out. And two, to put two nuclei together takes a lot of energy, a lot of activation energy because protons don't want to be closer to protons. So you should know for the test that we can't do this yet. We haven't figured it out. And it takes a lot more energy to start the reaction than we get back out right now. This is the reaction that we currently use in our nuclear reactors. The problem with this reaction is that we create these fragments that sometimes have very high what? Half-lives. And we have nuclear waste that builds up on site. They can't ship it anywhere because it's too dangerous, so they keep it right on site. And of course, this can become an uncontrollable reaction called a meltdown. These three neutrons have to be absorbed by something called a moderator. If they're not, these will find more uranium. You can have an uncontrollable reactor reaction here, chain reaction. So these are the major differences. Okay? Any case, so bottom line is we're forming heavier isotopes from lighter. Um, they both are converting mass to energy. So you can't say that. This one, lighter, make heavier. So choice two is the answer. Okay, 47 is a half-life problem. Okay, and this half-life problem, as you can probably figure it out, could be on a part two. Worded differently, here's how I do half-life problems. I don't know how your teachers did them. After 32 days, 5 milligrams of 80 milligram sample of radioactive but remains unchanged. What's the half-life? Now you could look in table N, but you won't find it because they want you to figure out the half-life. Here's how I do it. I draw myself a zero line. Zero half-lives, zero time, 100% of my sample before decay. Now they said after 32 days, so there was 32 days that transpired. Okay, five milligrams remain from an 80 milligram sample. So 80 milligram was the, um, was the initial size. So what are we gonna do here? Well, I'm gonna start having, right. Now the reason why I draw a number line like this or a zero line, I don't confuse myself. This is not the first having. So I say at the first having, okay, this goes to 40. Second having, this goes to 20. Third having, half of 20 is 10. And you can see that it takes half of 10 is 5. It gave me that in the problem. So five, I'm sorry, four half-lives occur. Do not count this. Okay, people tend to do that. So four half-lives occurred, 32 days transpired, and there was four halvings. What's the time per each having? Yeah, eight. And that's the half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the sample to decay. Now sometimes these problems start you with this number and they watch this number. How would you go backwards? So let's say they gave you that eight days was the half-life and you knew that four halvings occurred. You would double what? Back up. And a lot of people when they double back up stop right there. You gotta keep doubling till you get to the zero line. One, two, three, four doublings. Okay? Hey, 47 is choice one. And again, Clearly, that's a part two question as well. Again, we're working on the same stuff. 49, is each successful element in group 15 of the periodic table is considered an order of increasing atomic number? So you're in a group, you're going down. Group 15 is nitrogen. I skipped 48 because I whited it out, thank you. <laughs> Let's be crazy and go in order, Grodsky. All right, gotta watch me. Which electron configuration represents an atom of chlorine in the excited state? Excited state means an electron that was close to the nucleus, called the ground state electron, was given some energy. And the reason why this electron stays here is because the proton, what, attracts and pulls on it. Well, if it's given some energy, it can overcome that positive pulling force of the nucleus and go higher and become what? A higher energy state and be excited. So what we're looking for is a, is a hole an electron configuration that should have an electron there, but doesn't. So which one's going out of order, showing a hole? Three is correct. This should be two dash eight dash. What should three be? 
Seven, right, and that's a part two question. I saw that. They'll say, hey, what should this be? Have you draw it, right? What's that? Sometimes they draw Sometimes they'll say, draw an excited state. And when you draw an excited state, you don't change the number of electrons. People think you lose or gain electrons. No, no, no. It's an excited state of who? Who's 2 dash 8 dash 7? Chlorine. Because here's how these questions can get nasty. They could say, draw me the excited state of chlorine, and they could show me the excited state of <coughs> argon there too. Make sure you count the electrons. 8 plus 2 is 10, 10 plus 7 is 17, atomic number 17 is chlorine. Be careful here, okay? And in part 2, they could say, hey, draw me the excited state of chlorine. Well, if you knew 2 dash 8 dash 7, which is given to you in the periodic table, always is ground state, make it go out of order. I can do, I can do 1 dash 8 dash 8. I can't do this. 1 dash 9 dash 7. Why can't I do that? Yeah, I can't increase that limit. Good stuff right there. Okay, 49. Each successful element of group 15 of the periodic table is considered for order of increasing atomic number. So as you go down, what happens to the size of the radius? It increases. You're not going to have this up here. You should know as you go down, you get bigger. As you go down, you become more like a what? A metal. Okay, so the electronegativity decreases. So atomic radius, of course, decreases. But if you didn't know that, table S lists atomic radius. You could look it up. Go to 15, look up nitrogen, phosphorus, okay, arsenic. Look at them and see what's happening to their radius. And table S would give you the answer. So the radius, I'm sorry, is going to increase. The size of the atom increases. Why? That's a good question. Why does it get bigger? It has more <laughs> shells of electrons. That'd be acceptable. Or you could say that the more filled shells of electrons, what, shield the nucleus from the outermost. The more shells works. Certainly... You sound like you are prepared, wherever you are. Okay, yeah, increases. Two, 49 is two. Fitty, as we would say, if you're hip or not hipster. I'm not sure what that, I mean, that means. 50, okay. I have a video what hipster means, okay. Uh, and if you say someone's hipster, you're no longer hipster, as I've been told. I'm not sure. Okay, so, uh, that's the biggest, uh, I forget it. As H2O liquid is added to KNO3 to form aqueous, we just, made a solution. We just made three ions. Okay, I always call this a Kardashian wedding. <laughs> they write them together, but they're not really together. Aqueous means they're free. So they put these together, but aqueous, but really what's happening, it's K plus NO3. Okay, so what happens is you're going from a solid to free ions. Entropy is chaos. The chaos increased. One particle break apart into two. More more degrees of freedom in two free particles, even though they write it this way. Okay, you have to know aqueous means that there's free ions. They're not really together, okay? So the entropy or the chaos is increasing. Entropy is chaos. Okay. Fiddy is choice two. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break, and then if you want, you can skedaddle, but I'm gonna continue on with part two if you'd like, all right? I don't know until I'm done. I just need a break. <laughs>